Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. I'm going to be preaching out of a set of familiar scriptures to all of us. It's going to be out of Psalms 51. Feels like it's been a minute since I've been able to step behind the pulpit. I've been captured and been made work a little bit more than I like to work. And, and it's always good to come back. Amen. Amen. I'll be preaching a strong word tonight. Y'all love me and I got my amen corner out there somewhere. <laughs> We're going to be preaching on Psalms 51. We're going to start out with verse number one and uh. I think we'll stop around verse 13. Psalms 51. The Bible says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, bought out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, and you might be justified when you speak, and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts, you shall make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Yeah. Then will I teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted unto you. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, God, I love you. Lord, I thank you once again for another opportunity to preach this gospel, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, that you give me the words to speak, God. Give me clarity. Let me not say anything that you would not have me to say, O oh God. Lord, I pray, God, that you just bless the congregation, bless the hearts, God, and the ears. Lord, let them hear what you would have them to hear, Lord. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Amen. We all know that Psalms 51, we're very familiar with the story, written by King David. Nathan the prophet, he just came and he dressed King David. He made him guilty before God from his adultery that he participated in with Bathsheba. The plot that he tried to cover up her pregnancy all the way down to murdering her husband, Uriah, and having uh, slaughtered him out there on the battlefield, as well as killing his own men in the process, all to add another wife to his collection. Now David is faced with a fact from the prophet Nathan that sin has been addressed unto him, and it has came between him and against God. Sin separates the relationship that he has between him and God. The living in sin, day after day, living outside the will of God will always affect the child of God. Walking in willful, unrepentant sin will always separate our walk and our relationship with God. Here David understand that he does not have peace with God. God sent Nathan to give him understanding. God sent Nathan to shine a little light on the darkness that he was living in. God sent Nathan to bring clarity unto David. The big issue that he had is he sinned. He sinned in such a way that he actually thought that he got away with the sin that he committed against God. 
Sometimes we got to appreciate people when they're bold enough to tell us the truth. Yeah. When they're bold enough to speak truth on the matters of heaven and hell. Truth on the matters when we're walking outside of the will of God. we got to appreciate people when they give us another opportunity to examine our own selves and our own lives. And allow us to try to line it up with the word of God. we got to appreciate people that has the love of God inside of them. And wants only the very best with your walk with God. David finally, in Psalms, he sees himself for what he was and for who he is before the Lord. He's broken. He pours out his heart before the Lord. He states that these are my iniquities, O God. These are my shortcomings. These are my transgressions, O God. He says, I acknowledge my sins. David is saying, I acknowledge my failure. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge these evil deeds which I have done. He says, against you, O oh God, and you alone have I sinned. David says, I know that you desire truth in the innermost parts of us, in the hidden parts. God desires out of this core, this heart, the inner inside of a man. He desires us to want truth, to want holiness, to want righteousness, and to walk after his ways. David says, I know, God, that you want your character inside of me, your morals and your values to flow out outside of me. You want your fruit of your spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the temperance, the meekness, the faith, the characteristics of you, O oh God, to flow outside of me. This is what you expect out of me. This is what you desire out of me, O oh God. And this is what you demand out of me to make me responsible for, to give an account for all of my actions before you, and to give an answer for the deeds that I have done in this life before you, O oh God. Please, O oh God, David cries out, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. That's one of my favorite things that David says. Create inside of me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew in me a right spirit inside of me. David says, create in me a clean heart. He wants to. God has to get that rotten, dirty, black, sinful heart. God doesn't slap a band-aid on us. God doesn't try to rehabilitate us. God starts from scratch. That potter, he takes that clay and he begins to mold a heart of flesh. We understand living in sin, it will indeed separate us from the presence of God. The fundamental truth of the Word of God is sin does separate us from God. But the heart, the heart is addressed a lot of times very little. It's not popular in a lot of this religious culture, in this religious society. It's not addressed behind most pulpits. It's not the highlights of most Bible studies. Most sermons seem to want to skip the things that pour up outside of the heart. Thousands of different of, of preachers this Sunday preaching their guts out to try to come up with shenanigans to please the people, trying to bring in the numbers, trying to bring in the message, worried about all that money out there, worried about the name of their ministry out there, worried about offending somebody out there, worried about pushing their gimmicks to drag in, as Brother John said this morning, that lost culture out there trying to make this gospel presented a more cultural friendly gospel to drag in that culture along with the lost most denominations most doctrines and most churches are preaching acceptance this day and age they like to say as he said this morning that God loves you just the way that you are that God created you special and unique and he doesn't want to change you. 
They'll look you right in the eye, look you in the face of the congregation, and never, never address that. The heart of the problem is the heart inside of you. What is in your heart is the heart of the problem. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart. This is what defiles a man, Jesus says. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders and adulteries and fornications and thieves and liars and blasphemes. These are the things that defile a man. These are the things that defile a society. These are the things that mess up this culture. It's because it's proceeding out of the heart of man. It's why there's evil and demons and darkness running rampage in our streets today. These are what messes up our society. People have a mind, a mindset that is destructive. People always living it up for themselves. Always doing, as I've always said, right in their own eyes. But the Bible says that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Carnal-minded preachers preaching carnal-minded sermon, sermons lead to carnal-minded Christians. I heard a preacher say, it always sticks with me. If the head is sick, the body is good as dead. If the junk that's coming from behind the pulpit, as Glenn Denon said, unholy doctrine will produce unholy people. Holy doctrine will produce holy people. When it lines up with the word of God, the holiness of God, he stands on his word. Oh, I want you to know from cover to cover, God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But we have to be changed by his spirit. The heart of the problem is not them. The heart of the problem is is you if you don't know the Lord. It's not our cultural issues and there's a lot of them. It's not society issues and there's a lot of them. The problem is not the pure pressures that it seems like society pushes in on us and there is a lot of them. We have a lot of issues with the LGBTQIA2 plus whatever else you want to affiliate and add on to all of that junk out there. But that's not the problem. Problem's not with the role models. The problem's not with our president or presidents. It's not with the White Houses or the courthouses or the schools or the government buildings. That's not our problem. The problem is with inside of you. It ain't your boss. It ain't your wife. It ain't your husband. It ain't your children. It is inside of you. And it is your heart. It's in you. It's hard for to swallow for those that don't know the Lord. When you tell them that you're the problem. You are your biggest enemy. It ain't the influences out there. It's you sitting on your couch. Watching whatever you do. And living however you want to live. That is the problem. And it's inside of you. It is you. It's your heart. And it does not and will not and never wants to light up with the word of God. Because it's carnal. And he is spiritual. I understand it's not always easy to hear. I understand that it ain't popular. And I understand that this ain't an exciting message. And it ain't one that you'll hoop and holler and cry and praise God and run up and down the aisles. But praise God, I feel I kept digging for a word. And God kept circling me back around. Yeah. Kept digging for a word and it kept circling me back around. And finally, two weeks ago, this is what I anticipated on preaching out of Psalms 51. And God circled me right back. I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. I know I'm one of those preachers that preach a lot about the conditions of the heart. But I want you to know that is where the seat of the problem lies. It's in the heart of man. It's in the heart of woman. It's in the heart that you do whatever makes you feel 
good. That is the problem. Me and my wife, we just got over being sick as dogs. Just got over it. Last week's been rough. The coughing, the sneezing, the runny nose, the sore throats, the, the back aches, the throat aches, congestion, feeling weak, feeling tired, just feeling dizzy and feeling awful and feel like I couldn't perform at my job the way they want me to perform. It just seemed like it ran all over me. I was out of energy. Took medicine. Medicine for them headaches. Medicine for them back aches. Took them sinus medicine. Try to keep my nose from running. Took medicine to, to make my nose to run. To try to get rid of whatever it is that's laying around up inside of there. Took congestion medicine. Took breathing treatments. You know, we tried, we got we got a medicine cabinet. You know, if you're sick, just come by the house. We probably got something that we can give you. If you're, if you got a headache, we got a couple different things that we give you for a headache. I want you to know, medicine can be a good thing, but medicine only treats symptoms. Felt like the symptoms, they never stopped. I'll take one thing, something else will pop up. Like something for my, the kink in my neck, my foot will start hurting when I start coughing. You know, something was going wrong. No matter what I did, something else would pop up. And we asked ourselves a question, why? Why do they keep popping up? I treat one and another one comes up. I treat that one and another one comes up. She'll treat herself and something else will come up that I ain't seen before. You know what I mean? Something always comes up. And I got to thinking about this message because all these symptoms are caused by a bigger problem. All these symptoms that defile you come from a bigger problem. It's an outward show of an inward work of your heart. People tell you, trust in your heart, follow your heart. What does your heart tell you? Do whatever your heart tells you to do, whatever makes you happy. Next time somebody tells you that, I want you to look at them and say, shut up in the name of Jesus. Because the Bible teaches us that our heart is or deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? David, he addresses it. He said, oh, Created me, oh God, a clean heart. Yeah. Jesus says, unless you be born again, yeah. you cannot see or enter into the kingdom of heaven. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I am changed. It's what Paul is saying. Ezekiel says, a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit inside of you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you shall keep my judgments. And he says, and you'll do them. Why? Because you're a new creature in Jesus Christ. You're a new creature. God has perfectly formed you over again. He gave you a new spirit. He gives you a new heart. A preacher that never deals with a heart issue does not have a heart for God. Because that's where all the problems in this life will lie. Is with your heart between you and between God. That's why most of America, most of the world, a lot of most of them, they, they believe that they're saved. They walk the aisle once a point in time. They, they, they address the, the sin issue. They say they repent it. They, they always say, you know, 
I think I'm born again. You know, they, they've done all these different things that we contribute on a, having a relationship with God on salvation, on being saved, and all the repeat after me. And perhaps now some of them even, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know, we got all these different things that we can get lost people to participate in to try to make them feel closer to God. They understand. They know that they don't act as good as they can be. That's true. We know. They know. They know that they don't act as good as they can be. But the world out there, in a large part of the church world out there, believes that they can just give them a little help, point them in the right directions, regardless they had an unrepentant heart or not, they're good. They got this, a little vice, a little help, a little push, a little, little scripture memorization, a little Sunday school, perhaps just a little prayer time. Perhaps they got just enough morals to keep coming back every now and then and blessing us with their presence. They've been to the Sunday schools and they say, I've said my sorries, Jason. I work around a whole lot of people that say that they're saved. They still smoke their dope and drink their liquor. They do all these other things under the sun. And they will debate with you and tell you that they're closer to the Lord they never have than they have ever been. And none of this stuff is wrong. They can live any way they want to live and justify the things that they think is right in their eyes. Society teaches them that it's wrong. Mom and Daddy raised them to they should know better than this. Perhaps feel guilty. Perhaps some of them got caught up in some junk and now all of a sudden they got a sorrowful heart just because they feel bad and just because they know society doesn't agree with them and just because they know it just simply ain't right and just because they cry. And just because they weep after the things, the dastardly deeds they've done against the Lord, they've done against society, they've done against whoever, just because they feel bad, doesn't make it repentance. I looked up the dictionary definition of repentance, and I don't completely agree with it. It says repentance is regret, remorse, Sorrowfulness, shame, guilt, self-condemnation. Repentance is not based on feelings of emotion. It has something to do with it, but it's not based on feelings of emotion. Just because you feel bad, does it make God clean up that dirty black heart of yours? That's right. Just because you feel guilty, just because you got caught up in some stuff, just because maybe your wife or your husband caught you looking at something, just because you feel bad, it doesn't make it repentance. Second Corinthians, I don't know I preached on this before, a sermon I think just on this one place right here. Seven and ten. For godly sorrow worketh repentance for salvation, not to be repented of. For sorrows of the world worketh death. We have two different shadows of repentance here. My wife hates. She just likes when I use what I'm fixing to use. I look at my wife. I tell her that I love her. And if I send her off to work and she comes home early, surprises. Maybe I love you. And I had another woman in the house. <laughs> and I start to cry. I say, baby, I love you. I'm so sorry. You're the apple of my eye. You're, I, I feel bad about that. I should have never done this. And she starts to cry. And she says, why would you do me like this? You're supposed to love me. And I say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And she says, baby, I forgive you because I love you. And I send her off to work. Next morning I get up, I give her a big old kiss, and I send her out the door, and I say, go have a good day, baby. And she says, you know, I don't come home early just to spend time with my husband. And she busts through the door, 
And there I am, guilty, got another woman in the house. She begins to cry and tell me, you know, you promised that you was going to love me and be faithful to me and we have a covenant together and you swore before God that I was everything to you and there you go again cheating around on me and I begin to cry and I begin to weep and I say, hey, you know, I love you. You're everything to me. I, I messed up. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And she starts crying and we reconcile our relationship and you know, she goes back to work and she's a worker. <laughs> Next morning, she takes off. I pack her lunch, say, hey, you're going to have a good day, you know. And she says, I'm going to come home early again because we had a rough week. Pretty rough. She busts me in early, and there I am again. She comes in this time. She's shaking her head. she got a kitchen pan in her hand. <laughs> and she says, she says, you're supposed to love me. And you're supposed to be faithful to me. And you said you was sorry. And you said you was wrong. And I said, I am, baby. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. And I messed up big time. Forgive me. And she said, hold on. Do you plan to do this again? Is that what's in your heart? You know you messed up. You know you done wrong. You know you're crying with crocodile tears down there at that altar saying, oh God, I'm so sorry. And God ask you, he'll ask you that question next time you do it. He'll make it real to you. He said, are you going to continue? Is your, is, your, is, your, is your heart going to continue to live like this, to do these things? Or are you really sorry to the place that you repent? Are you going to continue to live like this? And if I said, yes, I am. I know I feel bad. I know society tells me bad. I know it's bad because my wife caught me in the, in the heat of the moment. You know, God, it's bad. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He will ask, is your, is your plans to continue to live like this? And if so, you are not forgiven. And you're still dead in your trespasses and your sin and your life of iniquity and everything else that you had piled onto that heat. If your heart is not right with God. Preachers never address repentance. If your mindset is to continue. If the understanding that you have in your heart towards God. On the things that you do. Is you're not going to stop the things that you're doing. Repentance is supposed to be a change of mind. A change of heart. A change of direction. A change of opinion about what you want to call sin. God hates it, so I hate it too. God loves it, so I love it too. Even if I don't understand it, even if I might not like it, I still follow after you, oh God, because you're my Lord and you're my Savior and I'm bought with a price. The Bible says, know you not that the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you are not yours, for you are bought with that price. Yeah. Jesus bled and died to purchase you, to call you a son, to call you a daughter, yeah. all because come out from among them and be ye separate. Yeah. Separate yourself from that old mentality, that yeah. old choices, those old lifestyle decisions, those old friends, everything that you love. If you follow after me, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Deny everything that you want to do. There's choices to be made. And the choice is I choose you. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Choices. Yes. The Bible says, If I shall regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That means if I regard, I'm not going to change my ways. I'm not going to change my life. I'm not going to change my attitude. I'm not going to change the things that I do. Forgive me, oh Lord. Bless me. My sky daddy, use him like a slot machine. Bless me. Give me a house. Give me a car. How's that going to profit you when you bust hell wide open? How? If you can gain the whole world and lose your soul. You want God to bless you and you're living in sin? First thing God will deal with you. Repent. That's the first thing. When I go in there and pray, I say, Heavenly Father, God, I just love you. And he said, Jason, 
he begins to deal with. Issues he wants to get. Sin, situations, attitude adjustments, things, the choices that I've made in my life that are contrary to the Word of God. He wants to address them. He wants to reconcile with me. He wants to bring peace. He wants to show me love and mercy and grace. And He wants to deal with me and let me know that He dealt with me as a son. Because if God don't deal with you on the way you live, strong word right here, He don't deal with you on the things that you do. The way that you act, the way that you live, then the Bible says that you are a bastard, a fatherless child. God does not deal with you as a son. He allows you to do whatever it is, and the devil's hell out there in that playground that you want to do, and he won't even deal with you because you have pushed him off and pushed him off, and your heart is seared like a hot iron, and you don't want to hear no counsel from God. You don't want to hear the Holy Spirit tug and tap you on the shoulder and say, you shouldn't be acting like that. You shouldn't be treating her like that. You shouldn't be whispering and telling her and backbiting and do everything under the sun you want to do. God will deal with you like you belong to Him. He gives you a new heart. God will give you a new heart. He'll give you a new mindset. He'll give you new desires to do that which is right in His eyes. That Spirit of God, He makes you a new creation. He plants a new heart in you, a new spirit inside of you. That Spirit never smoked no dope. That Spirit never drank no alcohol. That spirit ain't never been bound by all these addictions and tendencies and vices in this life. You are a new creature. We got to put a lot of junk down. Put a lot of stuff to the side. Here a lot of people say, I just can't help myself. We're saved by grace. Through faith. Yeah. And not of works. It is a gift of God. He gives us grace to repent, and to believe. And He continues to give us grace day after day after day to continue on repenting and to continue on believing because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. You will chase after Him. You will go after Him. If you love truth, you will search for it. You won't just try to pick out ten bits of it that fit your lifestyle. You will wholeheartedly fall before the King and say, Holy, 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 and give your heart over to Christ wholeheartedly. Uh -huh. Ephesians 4 says that you put off concerning the former conversation, this former lifestyle that you've been living, you put it off because the old man which is corrupting according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind to put on the new man, which is after God, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Romans 12 says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service to follow after Him. Reasonable. He says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for your life. You will see it because that Holy Ghost will deal with you. And it will deal with you because you are a son. And you are a son and you belong to Him. Repentance brings change. Change brings choices. Choices all made for God. You will go a different way. You will live a different way. You will act a different way. And as we always say, you won't be leaving here like you came in Jesus' name. Your direction has changed. I know a lot of us said we've saved the prayer. Yes. Oh, we walked the aisle. Yes, we repented. We repeated after me. Yes, I've been dunked in the water. Yes, but has your heart been changed over to God? 
Has everything inside of you been made new again? Your different desires, your life changes? Or are you a different person? You know, it says examine yourself, test yourself, see if you're whether you're in the faith. Know that you either belong to Jesus or you don't. Know that if he's working on you, that there is no change. You're still a dead man. You don't belong. That's harsh. There's no change in your heart. No change in your life. No change in your attitude. No change on how you live before you've encountered this Jesus. And after you've encountered this Jesus, then you're dead. And God has never done a work on you. I know it feels like I'm preaching to the choir in here, I'm preaching to the faithful, saved, those that have always been here. But perhaps it's my mother. <clears throat> perhaps it's for up there. Perhaps it's for somebody down the line somewhere. If God has not changed your heart and changed everything about you, you might not know that. And if he hasn't changed it, you would know. You would know. I remember hearing a preacher, and I'll say this, and I'll quit. I'll tell you this quick story. Y'all heard me say it before. There was a preacher, and he was on the way to church one night. And he was headed to church, and uh, he came in late, about towards the end of the service. And they said, preacher, what happened? You're supposed to be preaching tonight. He said, let me tell you what happened. I was on my way to church, and, and you know, my, my tire had a flat tire, and I got out, and I began to change this tire on, on my vehicle, and I popped off a lug nut, and it popped off, and it rolled out there in the middle of the road, you know, and I walked over there, and I bent down to pick it up, and about that time, bam, I got hit in the face by a log truck. It knocked me about 35 feet, and I want you to know, that's why I'm late tonight. And they said, a log truck hit you? He said, log truck right, right there in the face, you know, and it bounced me through in the ditch, and I know I'm not even dirty, but one or two things are going to happen. They're going to say, A, you are a stinking liar, or B, you're crazy, because they understand the concept, and you need to, too, that if you come in contact with something so mighty, something so life-changing, something so holy, there's going to be a change. Not yeah. only noticeable to you, but noticeable to everybody yeah. else around you. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. Yeah. If you need prayer tonight, let you come. If not, we'll pray real quick. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, God, I love you. Lord, I thank you, God, for another opportunity just to preach your word, to feel your presence, oh God. Lord, I pray, God, that it went out. And it's going to accomplish exactly what you want it to accomplish, Lord. Lord, I ask you to go with us tonight. Keep us safe, oh God. There is one, Lord. Please pray tonight. Let them come. If not, I'm going to turn it back over. In Jesus' name.